in sixth grade in a Taiwanese public school. I was in a storytelling class learning in Mandarin. And one day, we were assigned as a group to produce a book. And I was so inspired that I wrote the whole book, every last word. My group members certainly had no complaints. So I showed our first draft of the story to the teacher. And she had a rather interesting response. There was a line in our book, well, my book, really, <laughs> that described the sky as gray with faint bits of pink. And I quote my teacher. She said, there isn't such a color in the sky. Two things came to my mind. One, she probably doesn't leave the house often. <laughs> and two, she could not allow a reality she had not experienced. I remember feeling hurt and righteous at the same time. I wanted to challenge her, tell her she was wrong. But how could I? I was just a kid. In the end, as a good Asian student, I changed the storyline. The sky was blue. The sky was blue because if she couldn't accept a blue sky, what other color could we possibly agree on without causing a kerfuffle? <laughs> when I became a teenager, creative writing was something that I thought I lost. School got in the way. I'd spent most of my day at school, then after school to cram school to prepare for upcoming exams. I had no time to write. My pen was cold. And not only did I not have time to write, but I seemed to have lost my sense of inspiration. And it wasn't until a literacy class in my senior year here at Green School that my passion was brought back to life. And this brings us here at a moment where I finished a collection of short stories. <laughs> I would like to read an entry of one of them to you today. This one is called Parietal Lobe. Good morning, Lou, Olga Kuznetsov said when she walked through the wide wooden doorframe of Lutaro's farm and fruit shack. Morning, Signora. Fantastic day, wouldn't you say? Lou replied. He looked up from the counter where his aging sight had been focused intensely on packaging the peaches in plastic foam wraps that looked like sexy fishnet leggings on the blushing fruits. Behind Olga, the Georgia sun beamed and cast small shadows along the rocky path that led to the entrance of Lou's farm. Green vines wrapped around the sides of the wooden house and seemed to lift it up like a castle on a hill. That is how Lou liked to think of his family's estate, a castle. Beside the shop, as far as the eye could see, were acres and acres of land filled with strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and the most famous of the produce, peaches. If you would like to know what happens to lose peaches, come outside and check out my booth. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I write short stories? What about them is so captivating? It's because you're not confined by a single idea. You can write as many pages as a novel, but get to showcase 20 different ideas at the same time. I enjoy short story writing because of two reasons. One, it gives me the sense of incredible excitement and focus that rushes all over my body. And as I research deeper, I realized that what I was feeling was commonly known as the flow state. The flow state's official definition is the mental state of operation in which a person performing an activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement, and enjoyment in the process of the activity. This state happens when we encounter a challenge that tests our high skill sets, where our capacities are then stretched to the limit. And it is often described as a state of mind where you experience a moment of ecstasy and seem to enter an alternative reality. This concept in positive psychology was discovered by psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. 
He interviewed musicians, poets, and artists, and different people who have experienced the flow. And what appears to happen when we're met with a doable challenge is that we lose our sense of time. Our existence seems to suspend, and we feel a sense of serenity and great inner clarity. I write. I write because of the flow. And whenever I write, material just flows out spontaneously. We as humans always put such an emphasis on happiness. And psychologists argue that achieving a flow state is the way towards a joyful life. Opposite of watching TV, flow is an optimal experience that does not sell pleasure easily. It requires work and effort above all else. So, how do you find your flow? You can start by doing what you love. Push yourself, even just for five minutes a day. Find an environment where you have no distractions and pour all you have into the process. You'll know when the flow hits when your body feels like it has a mind of its own. The second reason I'm so attached to writing is because I feel like I'm in control. I can create a whole fictional world where characters are molded by me. Their every action and every word is manipulated by me. In a world that is constantly changing, we can feel fear. We fear what we don't know. We are spiraling in the dark. No one knows what our future holds or if it will even exist. And this is the exact time that we should dive into our own heads. Create characters in our stories. Dictate the plot's twists and turns. Paint things that we wish were. And write music that takes us to another dimension. Short Stories does just that for me. I can ignore my surroundings and create fictional characters that I love or hate. I can give Sally diarrhea from bad Thai food, <laughs> or I can have Joe be haunted by a murderous cherry tomato. The endings are unlimited. It is my emotional outlet, and it is where I, and only I, get to decide what is the past, present, and future. Creative writing needs something, and that is creativity. A lot of people say they lack creativity, and that is untrue. Does that make you all liars? I think it does. <laughs> Everyone is creative. You don't need to be able to paint very well or be able to dance ballet. And you certainly don't have to be depressed or to have experienced childhood traumas to be creative. You can be creative by solving a math equation, making a joke, or simply wearing contrasting colors on the same day. What we need to do for our creativity to blossom is to stop ourselves from judging, from doubting ourselves, because our brain can generate an explosion of ideas. Creativity is unlimited. Constantly ask yourself, what if? What if I had a club sandwich that could talk? What if I woke up with a spider in my ear? Stay with me on this. What if I choke on my spit during my greenstone? <laughs> Everyone is creative. Everyone has ideas too. But ideas are just ideas, and they mean little to nothing until we act on them. Persistence is key. I often found myself um, writing a new sentence for a short story and feel great. But what happens after those two lines? Nothing, if I don't persist. The most important thing as a human is to not judge our artistic work harshly. We should simply imagine and show integrity in our art because there are no absolute truths, no rights or wrongs. We shouldn't hide what we create, and we shouldn't modify our work for others' eyes, because ultimately, we produce art for ourselves, therefore our eyes to feast on. And if others find joy in your art, great. But if they don't, don't be discouraged. Don't change your aesthetic, because no matter how many times you change, there will always be somebody who just doesn't like your art. And that is completely okay. One thing I think we should definitely have when we're exploring our creative limits is having curiosity, because it can feed us like no other. We shouldn't commit to a vision of an endpoint. 
We should keep our minds curious about what could become of our product. We shouldn't rein in our creativity or stay on a set path. Because creativity does not behave rationally. We cannot and should not control it. It is uncertain and it will always be uncertain. And that is a beautiful thing. Because in uncertainty, you can always unearth something new. Ken Robinson once asked us, once said, that we grow up to be educated out of our creative capacities. I think creativity often seems discouraged and oppressed because we stigmatize abnormality. We fear people who are different. And that is why creativity feels oppressed. Schools often say they encourage creativity, but they don't want something they can't and won't understand. They want it within boundaries. They want it in a glass box. They hand us assignments like, make a storybook, but restrict our content, restrict our sentences, and even restrict the color of the fracking sky. <laughs> why is that? Public school teachers, especially in Asia, prepare for kids to become doctors, businessmen, and dentists of the future. They don't want kids exploring occupations like being a musician, a poet, or an artist, because all those jobs get you nowhere in Asian cultures. That is what we hear every day, and that is also why we lose parts of ourselves to the system every single day. There's a question I want you all to keep in mind. Why do schools teach us about what's happening all around us, but neglect the importance of internal exploration? There are multiple things I would like you to take away from my greenstone today. I would like you to accept the challenge and work to find the flow, because your life can't change. And I urge you, I really do, to dive into your own head daydream and discover. Don't hide what you create. And lastly, don't ever let anyone tell you what color the sky should be. 